All right, good morning. Good morning. We're here to talk about Web3 and blockchain and metaverse <laughs> and you know, everything we talked about last year. Something changed, I don't know. It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some, some little thing happened last <laughs> November. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, I don't think there's been a session out here on any of these stages that didn't talk about AI, so we're gonna do some more of that. Yes. Um, Rebecca, tell me, like, when was the first time you realized this was different from some of the other hype cycles we've gone through in tech, but also in AI in general? Yeah. Well, I've been, I've been involved with AI literally for decades. So I've seen all kinds of AI winters, but I've also seen the places where it was successful. And in the past, those successes were very narrowly focused. We can figure this out in a particular domain. We can win at Go. We can you know, beat a, a human chess champion. But those are very narrow domains. And the thing that struck me when this first came out was that there was skill, and in some cases even skill at the level in some of those very narrow do domains, but it was so much broader. Mm. And you're talking about like chat GPT, Gen AI is yes. broader? Yes, yes. Um, the, the, the thing is uh, AI overall has been improving over all that period of time, in part because, thank you very much, Gordon Moore, Moore's Law just kept meaning we've got more memory and we've got faster chips, and so many of the algorithms haven't fundamentally changed in years, but we can do things now because of Moore's Law and just the, the sheer quantity of data that we have available to us. And so when you put all of that together, it's like, you know, we're probably still going to, going to at least go through a freeze because the hype around this is incredible. Um, I intentionally, when I give talks that have at least something other uh, as a main point, I try not to say the phrase Gen AI for at least 10 minutes uh, because it's every, too late. Too late. every conversation with board members, with taxi drivers. I mean, it's, it's incredible how many people, this, it's just you know, seared into our consciousness. Now you said there will be a freeze. Do you think that's inevitable? I think it's inevitable with almost any revolutionary technology because what, what, one of my mantras in the technology industry is there are no silver bullets but everybody really desperately wants a silver bullet. And so they're gonna say, well, Gen AI can be used in this. And it's like, well, no, that doesn't take advantage of any of the properties of Gen AI. And in fact, a perfectly good decades old statistical analysis technique will serve you just as well. But sure. uh, so people are going into this thinking that somehow it's going to you know, be magic fairy dust. and. I hate to break the news to people, but it's not magic fairy dust. <laughs> <laughs> not quite yet, maybe in a few years. Yeah. But um, is that something you have to talk to your clients about, though? Because I, my sense is that a lot of you know, large enterprises are really trying to figure out a strategy for all of this. Mm -hmm. But do they really under, your customers are, for the most part, very large enterprises. Do they know what the capabilities are and what the limits are? Um, it, it runs the gamut. Um, uh, I was having a conversation with the CIO of a very, very large conglomerate, and he's very switched on. Um, and they are proceeding cautiously enthusiastically, is how I would phrase it. They've got very strong guardrails around anything that goes out of their, their enterprise control. Um, but they have looked across the organization and come up with four generalized use cases that they're now experimenting on. Uh, we have some who are in the magic fairy dust land and it's like, okay, well this is, you know, I can just give my, you know, 25 year old COBOL legacy program to ChatGBT and it will rewrite it in Java for me and it will be nice and lovely. Uh, and, and so those people you have to sort of talk off the ledge. Um, and there are still some that are almost too cautious. 
um, who are looking at this as, if I can't guarantee what it's going to give me, I don't want to use it. Mm -hmm. And those, those two polar extremes are not helpful for their enterprises. And so part of it is dragging this person and saying, look, you know, if you've got a human in the loop, use this to help your customer service representatives or your marketing people or your PR. Um, just make sure you keep the human in the loop because many of the horror stories that you hear out there are because the human got left out of the loop. Either uh, they were lazy or they just didn't think about it. Do you think it's just a matter of time though before you don't need before we don't need the human in the loop anymore? Um, I think for, for most tasks that have any degree of complexity, you're still going to need a human in the loop. Um, the ability to, the ability to, to automate the low hanging fruit is clearly very rich there. But then we've had that for pattern recognition and categorization and such again for decades. People just don't think about it because it just happens in the background. And since it's not sexy, it's, it must not be AI if it's not cool. Um, but I think that for many of these things, you're going to take out the mundane tasks. Well, the good news is that means the humans get to do the interesting part. Mm. Uh, the humans get to use their brains to figure out maybe how to assemble these pieces if you're thinking about it from the perspective of code. Or you get to look at output and put that, that stamp on it that makes it more personal. Sure. Um, now, I will also say my crystal ball is broken. It has actually never been very functional. Um, and so it would not surprise me that at some time in the future, there are many tasks that don't involve humans anymore. Um, but the advantage humans have is our ability to adapt when things don't go as expected. And that's still something that AIs are not very good at. Sure. sure. Well, let's talk about one of those tasks specifically. I mean, at ThoughtWorks, you've got, you know, a lot of your employees are coders, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the first use cases that a lot of people were, you know, where people perked up was, oh my God, now I get really good code completion. I can have ChatGPT write code for me. What was that like inside the company for you when, you know, those systems came out and how did you implement those yourself? So ThoughtWorks is a global software consulting company. We write code for other people. So we have you know, lots of not just developers, but experienced designers, business analysts, project managers, uh, testers, things of that nature. And it was interesting because we, we kind of had the same gamut of, of reactions from people. Some enthusiastically picked it up and oh, look at what I can do now. Uh, we had one person very early on who wrote uh, effectively a scenario generator to help with ideation sessions where you could select, do I want wild and wacky or do I want pragmatic or do I want conservative for my ideas and this is kind of what I'm looking for. And it will generate possible scenarios for you to then explore further. A perfect application in something com completely unrelated to actual code. Um, but we've had uh, very experienced programmers who, you know, what, one of them used the, the classic American phrase, you know, you, you can pull my co-pilot out of my cold, dead hands kind of thing. Um, we have another one of our senior developers uh, who doesn't like co-pilot at all but uses the chat GPT interface to get the code snippets because he likes that style of interaction and he likes the separation, whereas other people are really more enamored with having the NIDE experience. Sure. Um, and so it's, it, it's kind of like the, uh, the Emacs versus Vim debate. Um, <laughs> are we still having that one? <laughs> yes, we are still having that one. Um, but I think, um, some people just like that chat interface and the, 
the more free form nature of it. And it also then allows them perhaps a bit more readily to leave out what they don't want to take into, sure. into the code base. Yeah. What about the junior developers though? Like I get different opinions here. For some it's really helpful, for others it just, yeah. let's say, well, maybe they're not learning because they're just getting code from chat GPT. Yeah, and, and that's, that's a big part of my concern. The first time I, I heard somebody say, oh yeah, we'll just let our, you know, just out of uh, uh, college, you know, graduate developers pair up with, with Copilot and they'll learn how to be senior developers. And it's like, that's a really scary thought. Um, because senior developers know how to spot things. I've written enough off by one errors that I know when I look at a piece of code when an off by one error is there. Junior developers don't necessarily know that. And so if ChatGPT or a Copilot gives them something that works, it's on that developers, it's their responsibility to try to figure out, okay, why did that work? Because they weren't involved necessarily in the, I'm going to piece these things together, and therefore they don't know the rationale. Really? A senior developer would understand the rationale. Oh, that's interesting that they picked that, Copilot picked that particular approach. Um, but it's worse when it gets it particularly subtly wrong. And though that, that's our experience. And in many cases, it's subtly wrong. It's not blaringly wrong. And so the junior developer now has to sit there and figure out first what it was trying to do and why it's not working. Um, and it's, this can be at different code levels. Uh, one of the uh, Netflix en engineers wrote a post where he asked it to do, I believe it was the calculation of frame rate per second in video. And he immediately spotted the error, but then he's been working in that field for years. And again, it was a very subtle error. Sure. Um, the improvement from 3.5 to 4 and 4 plus has been significant in the quality of the code that, that comes out. But I think, that's, I think that's still the conversation that has to happen is actually how good is the code sure. that is being generated. And I, again, worry about that less with senior developers because if it's lousy code, they're going to do something else. Sure. But what, if it, a junior developer doesn't necessarily know that. Right. Well, what, what does that mean for the progression, the career progression for a senior developer to become like a senior technologist? Now? That's, that's the thing that worries me. Um, but I also think kind of the, the dynamics of the, the entire software delivery life cycle the weight of where we spend our time is going to shift away from, you know, as much hands-on, I'm just writing code, mm. to thinking about what the code should look like, to thinking about what the various components should be and how they should interact to be able to solve the overall problem. Sure. Um, and so I do think you're going to see new skills developing, but I am really worried about where, where do our you know, top class developers come from uh, of, of the crop that's coming out of school right now. Yeah. That, that worries me. Is there something you're doing inside of ThoughtWorks, they're pairing them with senior developers? Or? We're, we're looking, at, we're running lots of experiments. Um, uh, we've got you know, several hundred people using Copilot um, on, on different of our clients and for internal projects. Um, we've got our learning and development people who are trying to think about, okay, so how might we approach, you know, training in, in, this, in this new world? Um, but w we're still using many of our, our same techniques um, we're big fans of pair programming, for those of you who don't know who we are. Um, and that doesn't mean that the pair has to be co-pilot. The pair could still be two humans who are using co-pilot, and so that still does, does, does give you the, the ability. Another interesting development in this, though, is, is what it says about the, the low-code, no-code space. Mm -hmm. um, because you, you now have the classic not programming language mm. interface 
to a low-code platform. It used to be the best they could do would, is the, the, the classic, what we refer to as doodleware and what they will, would call a visual programming interface. Um, but now you don't even need that. Right. Because people can express their problem in plain English and with things like ChatGPT. So I, I, I think there's going to be some interesting developments there. Yeah, which is a good thing. It, the more people can program, but also limiting to some degree. Cause it's just, yes. So. Yes. Uh, like I said earlier, there are no silver bullets, and some of these low-code platforms do a tremendous job on the first 80% of the problem. Sure. Uh, but what about the other 20%? <laughs> that's, uh, that's the problem. But um, switching gears just a little bit here, one um, of the issues that has come up a lot, less around code, more around images and, and everything else that gets generated with Gen AI is copyright. Is mm -hmm. that something your customers worry about with the code that you deliver to them? Uh, we have some who have specific concerns, um, and so one of the, the things that we've instituted is we will not use Copilot turned on in such a way that it will export code unless they want it. Okay. Um, some of them are actually looking at using some of the, the more closely hosted. I'm not a lawyer, um, but when you just think about how something like Copilot works, the length of the code that's being returned just isn't long enough to really get you into copyright issues. Now, sure, if, if you asked it <clears throat> to give you, you know, an implementation in Java of Dijkstra's al algorithm, well, the full implementation might be long enough. Um, but Dijkstra's algorithm is, is, is out there. Um, and so, uh, but, GitHub is, has said for, for proper licensing, we will, they will indemnify you if you are ever challenged on, on a code copyright issue. I do worry about it more for visual artists because if you think about the IP of a visual artist, it's their style. And that's precisely what those models are copying. You explicitly say, I want this thing done in the style of well, if it's, it's one thing if it's, you know, um, Cezanne. Sure. Doesn't really care anymore. But what about modern artists? Mm. Their style is being, and, and so that, that's, I worry about it more in the visual domain, in the music domain, um, and even in the more creative writing domain than I do in, in the code domain. Okay. But then again, I'm not a lawyer. I did not give you any legal advice whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy indemnification from Microsoft <laughs> and Adobe. I think they'll they'll happily you know let you pay some bills. <laughs> That'll work. Um, if you look ahead now, maybe just you know it's so hard. A year ago we didn't even talk about this, but if if, if you think five years ago, do you th five years ahead, do you think Gen AI will just be part of the landscape at that point? Will we even be talking about it? Will it just be part of everything that we do? I I think it will be. Um, AI is the superset, Gen AI is just one subset, and I think we'll, we'll either stop distinguishing them, which would be the appropriate thing to do, or we will refer to everything as Gen AI, which would not be the right thing to do <laughs> linguistically, but that doesn't always matter with the way our industry adopts terms. Sure. Um, but I do think they're going to meld. and. One of the things that, that, that I hope happens is the awareness of what is actually possible. There are some truly groundbreaking things being done with, with Gen AI, but you have to understand what it is about the Gen that might be relevant to your problem. And then maybe good old-fashioned AI might, uh, might serve you better. <laughs> Old-fashioned AI, like deep learning and those <laughs> yes. things that we talked about just two years ago. Now we have a few, about a minute left here. Um, last year we talked about Web3 and all those things. This year we're talking about Gen AI. Is there any other technology right now that you're super excited about that you think people should talk about more? I, I think there is going to be a radical rethinking when mixed reality is actually a thing. Okay. Because, sure, in gaming, in retail, in branding, we all know what that looks like. What would it mean to apply for a mortgage 
in a virtual world? How would your interaction be different? I think there are all kinds of things we use technology for that we don't, have no idea how we're going to take advantage of that. All right, so next year we'll talk about AR and forget about Gen AI at that point. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Fred.